Hello, everybody. My name is Reese Lindmark, and you're listening to another episode of Gray Mirror, a new podcast from MIT Media Lab's Digital Currency Initiative on technology, society, and ethics, where we look at both the positive and negative impacts of technology. And so in today's episode, I interviewed Taz Dreisha about UTXO, which is a way to scale UTXO-based blockchains like Bitcoin uh, with this interesting construction called an accumulator, which allows you to store this small set of proofs about your UTXOs rather than the whole UTXO set. Um, and as a heads up, the second half of the episode, we discuss the UTXO design. In the first half, we kind of discuss Taz's background and the, the current options for scaling Bitcoin. Um, and just another quick note, today's episode gets relatively technical at the end, um, and at a macro level, our future episodes on the show, most some of them are going to be technical like today's, but a lot of them are going to be more tech ethics focused. Um, so today's is more about the tech side um, and less about the society and the ethical side. Um, and then let me just do three quick notes um, before we dive into the episode. The first is, uh, for me personally, the most fascinating piece about this UTXO thing is it's an example of what I would call applied research where it's designed to be adopted on the Bitcoin network, and so it has a bootstrap mechanism in place to gain adoption with this like bridge node thing. And so when you're doing research, and when Taj is doing this research, he's not just thinking, how can we create this interesting new construction? He's saying, how can we create this new thing that would actually help people, and in order to help people, it needs to be adopted, so we need to think about the bootstrap mechanism. Um, so for an internet example, when there's a design to transfer from the internet protocol version 4 to internet protocol version 6 standard and that standard that new standard ipv6 the version 6 was formalized in 1998 but it's taken so long that 20 years later in 2018 only 25 percent of network traffic goes over ip the version 6 today so that's kind of an example of what it means to upgrade these these internet enabled networks um and similarly with something like bitcoin your options are a soft fork a hard fork it but this is really difficult, right? So SegWit took two years to get in there. Um, and so UTXO uses this mechanism um, that doesn't require a soft fork. It uses this bridge node thing. So you can kind of transfer the people who are operating in the old network. You can transfer the kind of UTXOs into proofs um, for this kind of new network that, that works off of um, the UTXO. So and this mechanism has been used before with this thing called compact blocks, but I think these things are really fascinating, these new bottom-up, peer-to-peer upgrade mechanisms um, that use these networks of bridge nodes or ways to relay information in a peer-to-peer way or an incentivized way in order to bootstrap a upgrade to a network. Um, and just as a note, this is a similar mindset when we're thinking about something like scaling Ethereum, where you're saying, hey, should we upgrade something crappy like the EVM? Um, it, on Ethereum itself, or should we start with a new protocol like Definity or Kadena or whatever that uses eWASM? So, so that kind of mindset is is similar here. Where it's like if you want to, it would be easy to some extent to add something like UTXO if you want to just create a new coin. But because you're trying to add it into the Bitcoin um, network in a non-soft or hard fork way, you have to think about these ins- these mechanisms and adoption mechanisms. So um, that's one interesting point. The second is. Taj emphasizes this um, that privacy, security, and decentralization are based off these kind of like black swan style events. And what I mean by that is it is when you're thinking and you're trying to convince somebody, you know, to have more privacy or security, um, they're like, it's hard to convince them, especially if nothing bad has happened by not having that issue. Um, and so convincing folks against a possible issue um, instead of like a very clear thing that's going to happen to them is hard. Um, and so this is this question of, you know, can you make something that minimizes the chances of a negative event? Um, And it depends on how big that negative event is. If it's a super negative event, then you wanna make sure you can dodge it. And so when you're dealing with something like Bitcoin, these events include lots and lots of money, so you definitely want to make sure you have the security and privacy to, to kind of dodge those kind of larger events, even if none of them have happened thus far. Um, So that's the second point. And then the third point is, um, Taj and I talked about this in a bit in the show, but he also wanted me to reemphasize it, and I super agree that this design, this UTXO design, is it's crowd and it's community based. Um, there's been a lot of work on accumulators since 2012. There's exciting research being done at Stanford right now by Benedict Buns and Dan Bonet and a couple other folks, and so and that one has various pros and cons compared to Taj's design and these other designs, and so. 
as Taj is going through this and he's collaborating with those folks, he's collaborating with people at MIT, he's learning about um, stuff by going to scaling Bitcoin and, and getting critiques and criticisms and feedback on his design. And so there's this whole process that kind of goes into um, eventually coding something up or writing a paper, but it's really this very kind of crowd-based uh, system. And so I think that that is, uh, it's cool. It's cool to see um, academia use uh, this kind of standing on the shoulders of many giants <laughs> kind of mindset. So with that, uh, I hope you enjoy today's episode episode with Tash. Hello, everybody. My name is Reese Lenmark, and welcome to another episode of Gray Mirror, a podcast from MIT Media Lab's Digital Currency Initiative on technology, society, and ethics. Um, and today, I'm super excited to welcome Taj Dreija to the show. Taj works as a research scientist at the Digital Currency Initiative with me, so bias there. Um, <laughs> uh, and he co-wrote the Lightning Network paper and does a variety of other cryptocurrency research. Uh, Taj, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Yeah, thanks. This is fun. Yeah, excited to be here. Um, and so as a quick note for our listeners, um, the stuff that we're going to dive into today is mostly around some of Taj's new research on this thing called UTREXO. Um, before we do that, we're going to take a step back and just ask Taj more generally about why... Taj, tell us, why are you interested in like blockchain and cryptocurrency technology, and how do you see it possibly positively or negatively impacting society? Um, I guess, to be honest, a lot of it's inertia. I don't really think <laughs> about this every day. I, I was very excited about it in 20, 2011, started working on you know. And at this point, mostly, you know, the, the way people do is, well, now I have a job working on it. And I don't really step back and think, what what, do, what makes me excited about this? Um, but if I have to step back and think about it, it, it is still really exciting, maybe for different reasons than when I started. At this point, a lot of the, the, the excitement is there are these really cool technical problems. Um, and it's really fun to build these solutions to them where, okay, we're, we're faced with... Uh, in Bitcoin, you're faced with some of the hardest problems of, okay, you're in a network where every node hates every other node and they're completely distrustful and there's all these attacks and you're very resource constrained and it has to run on crummy computers and yet you want to make this global payment system that can send transactions. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough sell and you don't have the kind of resources you do with, with other problems. Um, so you have to make really efficient decisions and really efficient software. So that's kind of a cool thing to work on. And uh, that's some of the motivation. Initially, a lot of it was, um, this was fairly recently after like the 2008-9 financial crisis. I you know, hadn't been interested in finance, but had read a bunch during that period and sort of was pretty skeptical of these, you know, how this stuff worked <laughs> and saw Bitcoin. I was like, oh, this is really cool. This is sort of money that you don't need all this these existing institutions also um it reminded me of things like uh nutella mm. gnu like <laughs> oh <kind of laughs> not nutella the food no, not, not the, <laughs> the network from like yeah. early i think it was the guy who made winamp justin frankel or someone and he made this thing called nutella and he was employed by aol at the time which was like had been bought by time warner um and nutella was was just before BitTorrent, but same idea, where it was, you know, in practice, it was going to be used to download MP3s. Um, and that's probably what I first did when I downloaded it. Um, but Napster had been shut down, and Nutella was this sort of decentralized mesh network kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It had very poor scalability, mm -hmm. um, but I think it still exists in some form. Mm -hmm. And what I liked about it is like, wait, how do you kill this? You know, it's decentralized. Cool. Um, and then with BitTorrent, it's not quite as decentralized in that you're sort of relying on these tracking servers, which end up getting shut down, and, and the search mechanism doesn't exist with BitTorrent. So, so BitTorrent actually trades off some of that decentralization, whereas Nutella didn't. But Nutella had horrible scalability problems, mm -hmm. which we, we see with Bitcoin <laughs> as well. Um, so, so when I first saw Bitcoin, I was like, wow, this is interesting. There's all these incentives. And... You, you know, how are you going to kill this? It's really decentralized, and I can see the motivation to keep it running. So I was really interested in it uh, initially because of those ideas. Um, as time's gone on, you know, yeah, everyone sort of ends up a little bit jaded, and yeah. you see, like, oh, man, yeah. <laughs> it's not actually a crypto utopia. You end up with, like, 
rich guys getting richer because they were like, oh, I've got a couple million le- lying around. I'll buy a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Oh, cool. Now it's a hundred million worth. Um, it's like, well, I bought 10 bucks worth of Bitcoin and now it's worth a thousand dollars. Like, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. So, so I don't, I'm not like, it's going to change the world and make everyone happy. And I, I never really thought that and seeing years of experience, like, no, yeah, no, that, that doesn't seem like that's what's going to happen. So, but it's still really cool from an engineering perspective. Yeah, I think I think that's interesting. Well, a couple of things that are interesting there. One is I think reevaluating your why over time mm-hmm. is interesting. And saying, taking a step back and being like, why am I interested in this stuff still? Um, because sometimes there might there's likely to be a time in the future for both of us where we look at some of the work that we're doing now, blockchain crypto stuff, and say, you know what, I'm not into it anymore. You know, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's ex- it, at the same time. But it's, it it's changes. Like maybe I'm into this <laughs> aspect now. It's like, well, UTXO, the thing I'm working on now, I think this will help more than maybe the things I was interested in totally, five years ago. Totally, totally, totally. And I think I think it's the surprising nature, though, of um, of these decentralized, you know, Bitcoin and other decentralized like cryptocurrency networks, is that they're weirdly anti fragile, both in their incentive and monetary abilities to to stay alive and to stay afloat, and in their it's such an intellectual goldmine for people who are into computer science, into economics, into complex systems, into law. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, because of those things, even if you're not into it from the monetary side, you might be into it from an intellectual perspective. And then maybe it's not intellectual for a point of time, it's like still surviving. So yeah. it's, a weird, it's a weird system. Yeah. Also, it is super sci-fi. Like, yeah. this hasn't been quite as crazy recently, but it's just like weird. <laughs> and you end up like... I don't know, meetings in Hong Kong and there's like this consortium of like Chinese miners and it's just like, this is weird. Like I would have never gone to all these weird places and met all these weird people and like you're at 20 Mission in San Francisco and like the cops come in and drag some guy out and you're like... (laughs) I don't know what that was. Well, I don't so know like, <laughs> so, so it's, you know, I'm sort of a boring computer nerd and work on computers, but you get to see all this weird stuff. Yeah. And so that's like kind of fun. It's like, you know, William Gibson, cyberpunk kind of like, yeah, this is kind of fun. Yeah. Anyway. So do you think, so it kind of taking that for a second, do you think kind of, if we think about our whys and why we're into it, Thinking like from a more macro perspective now, do you think, how do you see, I mean, in general, it sounds like you're relatively measured and or skeptical about like, you know, the crypto utopia or like its yeah. impact generally on the world. What do you see though in the next, you know, whether it's one year, whether it's 10 years, you can choose your, your time scope, how some of this stuff will, the, both the positive and or negative impacts. Okay. That, so, so I guess there's, there's positive and negative and then there's also the idea of, okay, what's the scale? How much yeah, impact exactly. is that actually gonna have? Yeah. Um, I think positive impacts are you could, hopefully preserve a lot of privacy that seems to be getting rapidly eroded. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I use cash a lot and people start it. And at this point, it's sort of weird to go to restaurants and, and always pay with cash. Yeah. Um, but it's like, wait, this, you know, credit cards are, are convenient, but uh, nobody ever sat down and like really made the decision. Yeah, we're going to give all the data about everything we buy and do to these companies. And we're not even really sure who's got. Yeah. I, I work on this full time. I don't know exactly how it works in terms of data. Does Visa itself get all the tracking information? Does the merchant, are there laws? Probably there's a bunch of laws about this. I don't know. Uh, It's not something that's very transparent. Um, So I I hope that like privacy is certainly something. It seems like help getting a lot of privacy isn't, doesn't seem like a revolutionary new idea. It's like, no, we're just sort of back to where it was 30 years ago (laughs) when people carry around dollar bills and buy stuff and Nobody really knows the whole picture of what people are buying. And there's not a, a biz, the business model of the internet today is one of surveillance capitalism, which yeah. says, hey, it's really good if we ne- learn more about you so that we can sell more ads to you or something of that variety. And, and, and this is kind of a counteract to that to some extent. Yeah, this, this isn't, this is, yeah, because the default seems to be because of all this technology, you know, huge erosion of everyone's privacy without them really not noticing. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's, I don't think it's a, hey, we want to get to some like, crypto world where no one knows anything. It's like, no, we're just trying to get back to where it was <laughs> not very long ago. Um, what about so, on the negative side? What do you think are some of the... So negative side, yeah, there's, there's I guess, late 2018, uh, a lot of people have probably lost a lot of money yeah. when they bought in when it was $15,000 or whatever yesterday or last year, and, and now it's lower. That I'm not too worried about that because, like, well, you know, this is a super volatile thing, and um, there's there's a lot of scams, a lot of ICOs, kind of things. So that is, you know, kind of unfortunate, and it does impact the legit research as well because 
people probably are much more dismissive about this whole area now. Yeah. Um, but we've seen this a couple times, right? This happened in 2014. This happened before. So I'm not too worried about that aspect. I think that's interesting because it's like the the negative sides. It's something that like I think for you and I, we might not interact with that much because we weren't being sold these random like BitConnect style or whatever yeah, style. Yeah. Like, you know, I see those. And so we weren't buying into them um, or, or we just kind of ignored also, them. we know so- all about this stuff. So we're super quickly can be like, nah, come on. That's, yeah, that's yeah. nonsense. Versus some people where it's just like um, essentially like a variant on like predatory practices yeah. where it's just like, ooh, okay, we can claim these things to the world yeah. and then make a lot of money. And then the people, the bag holders or whatever yeah. are the, the general population. So, yeah, I agree yeah. that that's a, the technology gives us affordances to do bad things like that. Yeah. And then I guess you could do crime kind of – it might – the thing is it doesn't yet. It's like the idea that, oh, this could help organized crime and evade capital controls and all these kind of things. Yeah, I guess in theory, but like I don't really see – you know, there is some darknet markets. People are buying and selling drugs. It's not huge. And, you know, drug law, like so a lot of those things are like, eh, if people are buying weed, I don't really care. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's bad things too. But it, it doesn't seem like that is the real problem here. A lot, Most of this is used for gambling. Most of it is small time people are like, hey, I, there's all these rules about buying and selling stocks. So if you don't have a ton of money, you can't really day trade. Mm-hmm. There's pattern day trader rules and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll shut you down. And this is a lot of times it's 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 sort of like gambling, yeah. um, and so I don't have a huge moral issue with that. And I think yeah, and the other thing with the a lot of these technologies that pop up, they they pop up in places that are not in the realm or in the power of the status quo. And for something like these, you know, the Silk Road and these kind of dark net markets, it's like hey, these are things that can exist outside of the realm of the status quo, outside of the yeah. realm of the law. And they just like just like BitTorrent and those things back in the day, and, and Kazaa and Napster or whatever. <laughs> and so they kind of start to pop up there. Um, um, and then there's questions, there's, is the law morally justifiable or not morally justifiable? Something within the Ethereum ecosystem, there's this um, uh, thing called Spank Chain, and it, it's a, it tries to help, you know, sex workers make more money with, um, uh, and so it's like... Yeah, well, that, that, I mean, because that's, I don't know, is it like actual prostitution or is it sort of um, that one's just pornography? Camped. Yeah, that one's just like... Yeah, pornography. and so pornography, like, so I, I don't know if people, like, I don't, I don't actually really know what people do with Bitcoin, right? Mm-hmm. I just sort of work on it, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, I have read a lot that like pornography, they have enormous problems with payments. <laughs> and exactly. there was this like Operation Chokehold where people, sheriffs or some kind of government entity wanted and said like, okay, Visa MasterCard, stop providing payment services for uh, pornographic sites. And whatever your views on pornography, but it's like, well, this stuff is legal, mm-hmm. right? There's no law against it. Mm-hmm. And so you're sort of using this weird thing where you're trying to kill them by cutting off their payment infrastructure. Mm-hmm. If, but it seems like, look, if you want to make it illegal, try mm-hmm. to make it illegal. Mm-hmm. If, if people in certain communities say, like, no, we're not okay with this, all right, make a law. Now they can't do it anymore. Um, but this is sort of this weird, okay, we're going around. We're not actually making a law, but we're trying to you know, talk to private companies, Visa, MasterCard, whatever, and trying to cut them off this way. That feels you know, like not a good thing. And so it feels like there should be ways to make payments um, that aren't just completely reliant on private entities. Yeah. Um, and so that that was what, ca- you know, the government sort of printed cash and managed that for a long time. That's less relevant now that everything, all this commerce is happening on the internet. Um, and you're not seeing the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve is not implementing something like PayPal, Mm -hmm. right? They're not saying, hey, we've got this cash equivalent run by, you know, fed.gov or Mm -hmm. whatever and sign up or you don't even have to sign up. It's just like, here's this coin. Uh, That would probably be wildly popular, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but they're not doing it Um, because, (laughs) well, cash, it's, it also seems at this point that if cash were like a new invention, governments would like not be okay with it at all. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, we don't know. People are going to buy drugs with it. People are going to like avoid taxes with it and like pay contractors to fix their roof and not pay taxes. Yup. People do that. And that's the cash economy. That's a big part of it. And it seems like if that were a new thing, it would not. It, it has been grandfathered in. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. So, at a macro level, mm-hmm. generally, um, your why has changed over time, and you're generally, you don't believe in this macro um, crypto, you know, crazy utopia, really but there good. are both positives and negatives that you see with the technology. Yeah. Let's dive into, like, like so on the show, just as a note to the listeners, um, sometimes, like in today's show, we're going to dive in into the technology relatively deeply. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, Taj, could you tell us just more about 
I guess before we talk about the U Tree XO itself um, mm-hmm. and like accumulators more generally, can you tell us what is the problem that they're solving? What? Uh, okay. what's the issue? So yeah, so in general, scalability, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I mentioned Nutella, horrible scalability. Mm-hmm. Uh, that sort of crippling in Nutella's case. I, they eventually tried to make these like master nodes. Um, Bitcoin as well. The first comment that anyone ever wrote publicly uh, about Bitcoin was on this mailing list, and I forget the guy Donald something, and he was like, "Sounds like a great idea, but as I understand it, does not scale." Mm-hmm. And Satoshi replied, "No, I think it'll scale." And, and Satoshi was very optimistic about this. I mean, it was his creation. Um, it seems like he never, he, she, it, whatever, never really commented this way. But looking through it, they, they did implement a block size cap uh, a year or so after creating Bitcoin. And so it might have been that whoever created it eventually did sort of acknowledge like, huh, scalability is going to be a challenge with this. Um, and it has been the entire time. And so there was this whole block size debate war whatever <laughs> that seems to have died down because now there's sort of bitcoin the regular one and now there's bitcoin cash and stuff um but scalability is a big problem because in bitcoin every node has to validate every transaction and there's there's ideas of how to maybe relax that but to really get this security and the default way it works is um i make a transaction you to have to verify it, even if it doesn't involve you, because you need to know the whole state of the system to make sure everything's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so something like the Lightning Network, which I you know, worked on a couple years ago, this is a way to, to sheet, it helps scalability by shielding some of that information from everyone in that we can make a channel, we can update this, the balances in this channel without ever telling everyone else. Yeah. Um, so that, that segments it so not everyone has to validate everything. Uh, U-TreeXO also works to that. So maybe you don't have to store everything, even though you do have to validate it. Um, so there's all sorts of ways, uh, Schnorr signatures, where, yeah, everyone still has to validate everything, but maybe we can compact the things that need to be validated into smaller so it's not not as much work for everyone. So, so that's that's the, the big issue with Bitcoin. Yeah, so if I... And everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. any of these systems. So if, if we think about something like... Um, so there's there's a classic like number of transactions going through the network per second. When mm-hmm. a lot of people say scalability, they're thinking about like that where it's like oh only ten yeah, transactions. That's, that's a big part. Um, and then the but this sounds like it's it's different where it's like the size of the actual um, well, blockchain to some extent. You know, I mean, the size but, of the database. Well, yes, yes and no. In that the the limit the number people throw around with Bitcoin. Oh, it can only do seven transactions a second, or only can do ten or five, or you know somewhere around there. <laughs> Um, that's not an inherent technological limit in that, yeah, you could increase the block size. You could, you could just say, okay, we're, we're going to go with 50 transactions a second. Um, so there's, there, you know, and, and it's mainly this block size cap, which in Bitcoin now is, it's not even a regular fixed number now. It's, it's still one megabyte for, for non-witness data, but now you've got this witness data. So it ends up being around two megabytes. Um, but if you change that in any system, you can you can have way more transactions a second. The problem then becomes well, you can't keep up. Mm-hmm. You're going to need a data center to keep up if you have too many transactions mm-hmm. per second. Um, so so UTXO or Lightning or Schnorr signatures they do relax the requirements that could then potentially allow you to have more transactions per second. But those are sort of independent knobs where we say, okay, we're limiting it to 10 transactions a second so that everyone can keep up with the network on their regular laptops. And now we have reduced the requirements per transaction. So actually, maybe now we can turn it up to 20 transactions a second. Um, that That's how it would... So it yeah. does actually address that, but... Not directly. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, there are two different knobs. It's the essentially the, the block size knob of how many transactions per second could go through the network. And then there's the these other knobs where you can kind of compact things or shield things or do whatever to say, yeah. hey, let's make it so that it is easier to keep up. Tell me more about when you're talking about keeping up. So let's say I have my little laptop at home. Yeah. I'm trying to run a, like a Bitcoin Core full node or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm trying my best to keep up. Why would it be hard to keep up? So, if, so there's the... 
So there's keep up and catch up, I guess. They're the two <laughs> different things. So when you first start, you need to catch up because you start with nothing. Mm-hmm. And, you you know, Bitcoin's been around almost 10 years now. Yeah. And you, you start out with the 2009 Genesis block hash. And you connect to nodes and say, hey, what happened? You know, I, I just got here. <laughs> tell me what's happened for the last 10 years. Yeah. And they tell you and they say, okay, well, the first block was this and the second block was this. And you build up the blockchain and <laughs> validate every transaction that's ever happened. Yeah. And that's about 200 gigabytes right now. Mm-hmm. Um, same, same in all, you know, Ethereum, all these other... Uh, systems where you you start with almost nothing and they you have to sync up. When that, you talk about validate, you mean like what, what what does that process look like? So, you know, there's there's these transactions that have inputs and outputs. Yep. You say, okay, here's this transaction. It's spending these inputs yep. and deleting them, creating these new outputs in my database. I verify the signature. I verify that the coins that are supposed to be moved in this transaction actually existed. Great. So I, I verify all the rules of the system are being adhered to Great. Yeah. and then modify my computer's database. Great. Um, this takes quite a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a lot of downloading, a lot of CPU work, a lot of hard disk work. Um, so there's catching up and then there's keeping up. And keeping up is generally easier. So the keeping up is in Bitcoin every 10 minutes or so. It's mm-hmm. random, but on average 10 minutes, a block comes out. And there's a couple thousand transactions that modify the data, the you know the, the ledger of who owns what. Um, so keeping up is actually not too bad in Bitcoin right now because if you have a de- you know any laptop made in the last ten years, you can keep up. Mm-hmm. Um, it, like you know every ten, even if it takes you let's say one minute mm-hmm. to verif- to validate a block, well the blocks only come out every ten minutes. So yeah, nine so whatever it is, 12% of the time or something, you know, like every nine minutes of the 10 minutes, you're just going to be sitting there waiting. Yeah. That's not actually true because you you validate the transactions as they come in the mempool. But anyway, mm-hmm. you can think of it that way, yeah. uh, you know, a blocks only mode. Yeah. Uh, however, if it takes you a minute to verify a block and they come out every 10 minutes, but let's say you're catching up, that's going to be, that's going to take forever because there's half a million blocks. <laughs> so that means that it, you're if you're only going 10 times faster, mm-hmm. um, that means to verify 10 years of history mm-hmm. will take you a year. Yeah, yeah. And so now you're, you're saying, okay, I want to run Bitcoin. I'm going to have the best security and run a full node. I plug it in. I'm going to wait, have to wait a year before it's synced up to the network and I can actually start using it. That's, no one's, people, people just won't do that. Yeah. yeah um, no. And then, okay, I'll, although the the history, so so actually syncing, it, syncing up Bitcoin, catching up, mm-hmm. the first couple of years goes by in a blink because mm-hmm. no one was using it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so if you just have a percentage of, oh, I've validated all of 2009, 10, 11, 12, and 13, mm-hmm. and that only took five minutes. Yeah. Like, yeah, all of the work is in the last two or three years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, the, so that percentage number doesn't, yeah, you can't just look at that. But... Um, and so, so what the... And the real issue is that people won't do it. At a certain point... If you start this software mm-hmm. and it says, okay, this is going to take a month to catch up, mm-hmm. people just throw up their hands and don't do it. And, and we've seen this in Bitcoin mm-hmm. where people don't run full nodes mm-hmm. and they say, ah, it's too much of a, it's too slow, too mm-hmm. much of a pain. Um, in Ethereum, it's even a bigger issue in that it's very difficult to run a full node and catch up and keep up in Ethereum. Uh, and so you have things like, uh, you know, providers like Infura, things like that. So, so those... And the, and the other issue there is those tend to work okay. Mm-hmm. So in, in Bitcoin, there's SPV. Mm-hmm. In, in Ethereum, SPV is sort of the default. And generally, it works. Mm-hmm. We know about security problems, mm-hmm. but security is real hard, right? It only shows up after the fact when you've been hacked or your house has been broken into. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you're, you know, you can just not bother to lock your house up, and most of the time, it's fine. Yeah. And someone will say, no, you really need to have locks and your windows and all this stuff. Eh, no, no. <laughs> So, so it's hard to get people to care about the security unless there's a clear, look, this happened and yeah, someone yeah. lost money. So, 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 yeah, as you say, it's there's the there's the catching up, um, and then there's the the keeping up, and the yeah. catching up is hard, especially as 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 all these as Bitcoin and all the all these um, cryptocurrencies go further. It's like they're going to be around for years and years, and so yeah. they're going to be pretty big. And I think you said how how many UTXOs are there? Right now, there's about 50 million. 50 million. There yeah. were quite a month. There was 70 something million mm-hmm. a year ago. Mm-hmm. So it's actually so generally it goes up. Yeah. Right. There's more little coins at different places, and as more people use the system, but this year it's actually gone down steadily, which is kind of 
It's good. Consolidation of well, UTXO stuff. Yeah. It's good from a computer science perspective and that it's like hey it's less load on the network mm -hmm. it's maybe bad and that like maybe there's fewer people using bitcoin yeah, yeah, yeah. um i think in practice what it was is um big exchanges updating their software yeah, yeah, yeah. where last year they they had a lot of problems with their wallet software mm -hmm. where they were making lots of tiny little utxos like mm -hmm. dust mm -hmm. and then this year as fees went down they said okay we're gonna revamp our software consolidate all, all our utxos yeah, got it um yeah. so so and and so, as you say, it's like, so there's catching up and then there's keeping up. And the, one of the big issues here in, is like, the keeping up is generally easier. Catching up can be hard. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, and I guess the macro goal, goal here is to make it so that the amount of people who can run full nodes is it's democratized or it's easy. Yeah. Um, and so that anybody can run it so that it doesn't say, okay, the only people who are running Bitcoin full nodes are Amazon or whatever. Right. right? That is would that be bad. So yeah. that, and then I guess I should mention mining because this is also important. It, it's weird. So you want, so the keeping up or whatever, in some sense, if it takes you a minute to verify a block and you're keeping up, well, it takes an extra minute. Bitcoin anyway takes, you should wait half an hour or wait for a number of confirmations before you're really sure that you've received a payment. So in that sense, a minute or two of delay, no big deal. Where it really becomes critical is in mining. Um, in mining, if it takes you a minute to verify a block, that's a minute that you can't mine, mm -hmm. and you're just completely uncompetitive. So you really need to be able to, to see a block and then st start immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so mining centralization is a problem mm -hmm. then with, with, with large uh, blocks. However, in practice, it's maybe not as important because generally mining at this point is run by fairly professional entities. Mm -hmm. It's not like people are mining on crummy laptops. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got a warehouse full of ASICs mm -hmm. that cost millions of dollars, you can probably afford to, to have a couple, you know, rack mount servers and, and deal with and have good computer hardware to do this. Yeah. So while it's it is a concern that we want to make mining, you know, we want to make validation of blocks very quick so that mining can be more decentralized. In practice right now, it's not for other reasons. Yeah. And so not as huge of a concern, but all, but it like still is a goal. Like, yeah, <laughs> if miners can, can validate and run, you know, on very small amount of hardware, that'd be great. Um, but it, in practice, more important right now is to get end users who are not necessarily mining to be able to run a full node and get all the security and privacy from a full node. Uh, with minimal resources. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think that there's, um, as you say, it's a macro goal that I think the, the builders of the technology should vector towards, which is decentralization, because on the other end, you're going to have natural kind of aggregation and centralization yeah. Yeah. in most things. And so it's like, you know, if you can push back against it, then that's like a good, a good yeah. ecosystem. And it's, it's so. hard because the benefits of a more centralized system are very clearly apparent mm -hmm. in that you can say, hey, it's faster, it's cheaper, mm -hmm. it's easier to use, great, uh, but it's more centralized. And, and it's like, well, what are, the, what are you really losing there? Mm -hmm. And you're, the, the loss only can become apparent after the fact, yeah. where, hey, wait, my, my coins got confiscated. Mm -hmm. What the heck? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you did something illegal. But, but it's not illegal where I live, it's legal there. It's like, mm -hmm. well, that's where the miners are. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wait, the, you know, and so that kind of centralization where someone can confiscate coins, you know, it's an extreme example, but that can happen. Um, it, so it, it's it's like this hard to convince people thing mm -hmm. where, no, you really want decentralized. And that's what we had with this block size debate for years, mm -hmm. where people were saying, oh, this is crazy. Who needs to be able to run Bitcoin on a Raspberry Pi? Yeah. And that is something of an extreme case. Mm -hmm. But if you really make it so you need a you know rack mount server to run it, you're going to have very few users yeah. who can verify. And I'm reminded of like the, the, the concept, there's the concept of like, whether your system, I guess, yeah, if you, um, you can either protect yourself mm -hmm. against changes that will happen in the future where you say, okay, these macro changes are going to happen. I'm going to protect my like institution against them. Or you say, hey, I assume that there are going to be kind of um, bad things will happen and that I will, as those bad things happen, I want my system to respond positively to them. And so I think there's kind of that mindset, which is like, hey, assume there will be change or bad things or whatever. And how does the system respond given that? So in any case, yeah. let's, um, 
thinking about so there's so if we think about the scalability issue, it's not necessarily the transactions per second one. It's this other knob, um, the the ability to to yeah. validate. Because trans transactions per second is a dependent variable. Yeah, yeah you can exactly. set it to whatever you want, yeah. given how quickly and how much resources those things take. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and so, tell us about before we dive into Utrex. So, what are some of the other ways that people have tried to solve um, this getting up and keeping up kind of issue? Okay, so. So there's, I guess, SPV is one of the first. And what does that stand for? Simplified payment verification, okay. where the idea is I don't keep a UTXO set. I don't keep. I don't know who owns what coins. I don't validate signatures. I just see a block, and someone can tell me, "Look, you got a payment because it's in this block," mm -hmm. and it puts a lot of trust in the miners because you're basically saying, "Well, it was mined, so it must be okay." Everyone else is verifying these things, mm -hmm. including the miners, mm -hmm. and it's in a, I can I can very quickly and easily verify the proof of work. Mm -hmm. Proof of work is great because it co costs almost nothing to verify enormous amounts of work. So yeah. you say, look, someone spent a million dollars verifying this, mm -hmm. right? They they put a million dollars worth of work on top of it. So it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. Of course it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and and the thing is, in general, that does work. There's a lot of problems with it though, because you're giving up a lot of the you know, you're not val val validating it yourself. Um, there's also privacy issues with most of the implementations with SVB. So that was an early one that was written in the Bitcoin white paper. Um, and it, it's widely used today. But it's a lot of the people who work on Bitcoin Core are like, oh, we don't like SVB. Like it, it doesn't. People think it's a lot more secure than it is. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you could argue there's never been an attack. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's, there's never. We have no evidence of any you know, invalid blocks with valid proof of work that were used to deceive someone into accepting a payment mm -hmm. using an SPV wallet. We've never seen this. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an expensive attack to do. So that's what, you know, where you can say, look, it's fine. But the people working on it are like, no, it's not. We know how to attack it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we don't like it. Got so it. so there's an SPV. There's, um, I guess, the Lightning Network, which I co-authored and, and have been working on. And that's a scalability upgrade in that we can make many payments without putting them on the blockchain at all. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these payments have, we still have security, we still have the verifiability, but um, a lot of these payments never show up on the blockchain. So they don't count to the 10 transactions a second. Uh, so that can make it a lot cheaper and a lot better scale. Um, in Ethereum, there's a lot of ideas of sharding. So one thing I have seen a lot, that um, proof of stake and scalability seem to get <laughs> yeah. kind of like, lumped together and they're really different things like I don't think that so there are some arguments well we're going to do this and this helps prove stake but and this helps scalability but in general um, proof of work as a thing scales amazingly well in that you can you can prove unlimited amounts of work in constant time right so in, in the Bitcoin blockchain it's it's what 500,000 something um, headers it, it, verifying the entire proof of work for Bitcoin, mm -hmm. it only takes 30 seconds mm -hmm. on a decent computer. Mm -hmm. So so no one's bothering to optimize it. But there are techniques, there's papers mm -hmm. uh, about how you can do it in milliseconds mm -hmm. if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. But no one bothers to optimize because they're like, well, we could take this 30 second thing and make it into a millisecond thing, but like, eh, 30 seconds, who cares? Mm -hmm. um, so proof of work scales great. Um, I don't think proof of stake directly gives you any scalability. Yeah, it's a updates. weird question about like consensus mechanism versus scalability. Yeah, they, they've and they can, they're, they're they've gotten different. lumped together in a lot of people. So a lot of people have said, I've, I've heard this millions of times. Not millions of times, sorry. I've heard this many times. <laughs> um, proof of work doesn't scale. It's like, well, what do you mean? Like proof of work scales amazingly. Like look at Bitcoin. It's gone from, uh, you know, several million hashes per second to some number I don't know how to pronounce hashes yeah, per X, second. Uh, whatever, yeah. I think no more than yeah, I don't yeah, like it's some ridiculous. Exactly, you know two exactly. to the yeah, exactly. it's like two to the seventy four <laughs> hashes every block. That's crazy. Um, it's getting close to Avogadro's number, <laughs> and the and it, and it works right from from the software from the verifying perspective. Yeah, no problem. So so proof of work does scale. It's the other stuff that doesn't scale. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's fairly independent of proof of work or proof of stake. Mm -hmm. So in Ethereum, there's the idea of sharding, is that so the sh sharding is generally from database world where, okay, we have these different databases on different computers, and they don't keep track of everything, mm -hmm. right? Any one computer doesn't know the whole state of the system, but together they all do. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's a cool idea, but it's it's hard in practice to implement. Yeah, and I guess yeah, there's there's a whole ecosystem of various random scaling solutions, and yeah. I guess the main one that I was interested to hear about was yeah, the SPV as an initial yeah. one that has it's good and if, if or it's good in various ways, but it's a similar attack perspective as you said before, which is like it hasn't been attacked, but there are attacks that one could do on it, and so oh, let's be well. I, I would say in Bitcoin it hasn't been attacked. Yeah. There are other things that have. <laughs> I, I, I know there are SPV issues with other smaller sort of more niche coins because in that in those cases it's easy to deceive people. Yeah. There's not that much work required. Yeah, it's kind of like the the 51 percent attack where it's like oh it's never happened in Bitcoin but we've seen it happen in other uh, with yeah. other chains. Well, sort of thing. And and SPV there's other. Okay, so SVV is also not a super well-defined term. Mm-hmm. Some people might say, oh, this is SVV. Or I know, like, Luke Dash Jr., he's like, no, there is no SVV. Mm-hmm. These are light note. He doesn't call it that. So, so like, there's weird definition things. Um, many of the SPV-like wallets will show unconfirmed transactions, which I think is a horrible idea because mm-hmm. if you're saying, if you're running an SVV wallet and you get a transaction over the wire that's not in a block, you have no idea about the validity of it. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no way you can verify the signatures. Mm-hmm. You can't even tell if it's spending coins that have ever existed. Mm-hmm. Um, so that can be a potentially good attack. Mm-hmm. I don't know that people have done it, but if I know you're running an SVB wallet on your phone and I'm you know, buying a guitar from you, I found you on Craigslist, oh, cool guitar, okay, I'll send you uh, like a tenth of a Bitcoin for it. And you see on your phone like, oh, appeared, unconfirmed. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, yeah, he seems like a nice guy. Here you go. And I walk away. Um, For SPV wallets, unconfirmed means just nothing, (laughs) right? Because I could just fabricate a transaction, somehow get it to your your phone, and it'll just show up as unconfirmed, but it'll never confirm. Because everyone actually validating that transaction says, no, there's there's no signature here, or there's no, no, that UTXO is invalid. So so those attacks, I don't know personally of, of that happening, but... That is insecure to use. Uh, so, so you shouldn't do that with SPV, but people do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so, so SPV has some various both the the, the privacy issues and some of these problems. Oh, so pri- I, to mention privacy, um, many of them use Bloom filters, mm-hmm. which is was thought to be more secure than it actually is. Mm-hmm. Uh, you end up sort of leaking all of your addresses mm-hmm. to the nodes that you connect to on the network. <laughs> Which is not good because then they can sort of say, oh, all these 20 different addresses are all owned by the same entity. Mm-hmm. And so, so you lose a lot of privacy. Mm-hmm. There are ways to make that better that mm-hmm. people are working on now. Mm-hmm. Um, but in general, SVV is like, yeah, it works. There's ideas, but we can do better. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. So let's talk about the doing better. Let's, okay. let's talk about U3XO. So I guess tell us what um, <laughs> what is it? How does it work? Okay. So <laughs> it's an accumulator, which is something where you can... A Merkle tree is a pretty good. It's pretty similar to an accumulator. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it is. It is an accumulator by certain definitions. It's a. It's non-dynamic. You can't add or remove for it in the default sense. But the idea is, you store a very small bit of information, uh, which then people can prove much more information is sort of contained within. Mm-hmm. So if you're familiar with a Merkle tree, you generally store the Merkle root. And then there's all these little leaves of the tree that you don't store, but people who know about them can then prove that they are, you know, part of this root. Yeah. Um, so they, they provide an inclusion proof. So you say, okay, I'm proving that leaf seven is in this tree, so I give you a proof that's like eight and 14 or whatever. And then you say, oh, yeah, I verified it. Yeah, it's in there. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so Bitcoin uses Merkle trees um, really for SPV. That's the only reason you use <laughs> Merkle trees in Bitcoin. Um, so if you're running a full node, you never actually check. You could you could have just easily just as easily hashed linearly all yeah. the transactions to get the um, to get the block header. Um, but so w- the idea of UTXO, the idea of an accumulator is instead of storing a UTXO set. So instead of storing a what's now about a four gigabyte database of mm-hmm. every unspent output. Mm-hmm. Just have an accumulator for that. So you have some tiny little one kilobyte or one, you know, little thing. And then when people are spending coins, they provide proofs that their coins exist. Mm-hmm. Um, this seems like a really nice model. This is not a new idea. This is an idea. The general idea has been around for quite a while. Um, and it seems like great because then your wallet would then keep track of proofs that your coins exist as well as your private keys. Mm-hmm. So the, the proof proves to everyone that this exists. Then your private key allows you to make a signature that proves that you're the one who owns it. Mm-hmm. And then you can make these transactions. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea has been around, but it's had some implementation issues. So 
You can make um, like RSA-based accumulators. There's a lot of interesting new research on that. Uh, Benedict Bones at Stanford has a new paper about that. Um, those seem really cool. There's some issues with trusted setup where you might need to, to make this accumulator, you might need to have a number that no one knows the factorization of, mm -hmm. but someone did at some point <laughs> and then forgot it. But like you have to trust that they forgot it. So there's, there's issues there. Um, Hash-based accumulators also, lattice, people have been working on lattice-based accumulators. Um, one of the big issues that is not immediately apparent mm -hmm. is you need to bootstrap this system. Yeah. So even though it might work and you have a pretty good idea of like, okay, all the wallets keep track of their proofs and all the nodes don't keep track of the whole UTXO set, they just modify their accumulator every block that comes in. The issue is if you're the first person using this software, you can say, hey guys, I have this new software, I completely deleted my UTXO set and replaced it with this little tiny accumulator thing, and my wallet now works this way and, and keeps proofs for all my UTXOs, cool, let's, let's go. And then you connect to people, and they give you a block, and this block doesn't have any of the proofs that you want, mm -hmm. and no one will give you those proofs because they have no idea what you're talking about, <laughs> and so you're just stuck, right? <laughs> so the first mover now is stuck because how do you, it seems like how do you convince everyone to upgrade at the same time? Mm -hmm. This almost feels like a hard fork. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and hard forks are hard. Mm -hmm. And so you could say, no, we're gonna it's a hard fork, or no, I'm just gonna make my own coin. I'm gonna make accumulator coin, mm -hmm. and it's gonna have, you know. Um, but if you want to get it to work on a system that is already existing, how do you transition? And the transition needs what we what we call a bridge node. Mm -hmm. A bridge node is a node that actually keeps proofs for everything. Mm -hmm. the key, that it has the full UTXO set and also has a full set of every possible proof that could be required. So that when a transaction comes in uh, from the you know existing network, the bridge node looks at the transaction and says, ah, here's, I'm gonna look through my set of proofs, attach proofs for every input to these transactions, and then send it over to the new nodes who consume these proofs and ver verify them. Um, so that, in some cases, can be very costly to run a bridge node. In theory, you only need one of them to sort of link the old network and the new network. Uh, in practice, you want more than one because that's a single point of failure. Uh, you're not trusting the bridge node in that they can't really lie to you. You're verifying everything, but you are relying on them for availability in that if the bridge nodes go down, you're stuck and you can't continue. Uh, you're you're going to have to either abandon your idea of this accumulator and, and go to the regular node type or find another bridge node or something. So, so the cost of running a bridge node is important. And with some of the other constructions, can be very high mm -hmm. um, because these these proofs need to get updated every block. Um, with U3XO, it's a hash-based accumulator. Running a bridge node is not a big deal. It's still kind of heavy, uh, but you can run it on this laptop. Mm -hmm. um, so because it's it's sort of Merkle tree based in that you've got this giant. It's actually a set of trees, so a forest of Merkle trees, mm -hmm. um, and that's you know gigabytes of space. But what happens is when you modify the trees, you sort of are modifying all the proofs for everything without doing any extra work. Mm -hmm. um, if you keep the whole forest in memory or on disk, now all your proofs are being are able to be generated very quickly mm -hmm. from that forest. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the idea is the, the bridge node keeps the whole tree in, in memory. You might need like 16 gigs of RAM. So it's a little costly, but you know within the range of a decent computer. Mm -hmm. um, and when a transaction comes in, it looks up, it has another database of UTXO to position in that tree, which actually is quite a big database. Um, it looks it up, builds a proof, sticks the proof on to the input, and then forwards it to the nodes that want the proofs. Got it. Um, so it's doable with this construction. So, so, and so, pause for a second. So, let, let me make sure I understand this. So, there is both. So, at a high level, there are these things called accumulators, which mm -hmm. say, hey, um, they're, thing, they're called an accumulator because you can add stuff to them, just mm -hmm. like with, a, you know, with something where you're like, oh, I'm going to add things to this list, or I'm going to add things to this, this, you know, this binary tree. Mm -hmm. And then you also have these inclusion proofs where you say, hey, um, I'm also with something like a Merkle tree, you say, hey, um, I can prove that I am a leaf of this tree mm -hmm. um, by proving that to you. And so you, so that, at a macro yeah. level, that's what accumulator yeah. is. It's a and delete. So you, yeah. uh, in this case, you also, also need to be able to delete stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because if I can prove that I have coins that I actually already spent mm -hmm. last month, that could be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in this, in this accumulator is what's called dynamic in that you're able to delete as well as add. Got it. Sweet. Um, yeah, so it's a add and delete. So add, delete, yeah, exactly. and prove, add, delete, prove, verify. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, and so with this accumulator, the idea is that instead of 
um, holding all of the, you can instead, you could, because you get the log of n um, deliciousness of um, binary search trees or mm-hmm. binary trees and Myrtle trees, you get to, instead of holding um, all of the UTXOs in mm-hmm. um, that you need to know, you can instead just hold the accumulator. Yep. And then when you hear proof, when you get proofs from other folks, you're like, oh, I can, I get this proof from someone and I can check that proof um, easily. Is that yep. all you, kind of you relatively? Check the proof, checking the proofs is very quick. Yep. Um, and if someone gives you an invalid proof, mm-hmm. you just drop the transaction. Yeah, yeah. And I guess as you're saying, it's... Well, actually, <laughs> you, you drop the proof. This, this is a sort of one of the implementation issues is, what if there's a valid transaction mm-hmm. and the um, bridge node lies to you and gives you an invalid proof? Mm-hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean the transaction's invalid. Mm-hmm. The proof mm-hmm. alone could be invalid. So you you it's a little issue where it's like, wait, I don't know... Whereas in Bitcoin right now, if you get a transaction, you can immediately dis- determine this is valid or this is not. And then you drop it if it's not. Yeah. With with this bridge node and this accumulator, you might have a transaction, but you don't have a proof. <laughs> yeah. So that that's the sort of intermediate step, which you can deal with, but yeah. Yes, yeah, so I was actually going to bring it up, which is like, yeah, it, it, the... It does two things that you have to both check. You che- you're checking the UTXO in the classic style where you say you're checking to make sure that they had check the signatures. Exactly, check yep, the signatures, yep. and you're also checking the proof. And so you can mm-hmm. either either or of those could be on or off. Yeah. Or true you you got to ch- in, yeah. in practice, you're going to check the proof first yeah. and then validate the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because checking the proofs is in this case, it's it's very quick. Got it. So, yeah. um, so that's so there's the macro idea of the accumulator. And as you said, there's um, some cool research into these accumulators um, that has been done in the past, and and one of the most recent ones is this RSA. Accumulator. Accumulator that's yep. um, that was just released a couple days ago, um, and you at, that Benedict Buns did, and you and him both at Scaling Bitcoin this last year. Did yeah, we some talked about, about yep, yep. that and uh, your YouTube show stuff. But an issue with a key mindset towards this is. Um, uh, you're thinking about how to bootstrap the system, and because mm-hmm. I mean, you know that there are. If you're trying to, it's one thing to try to add the to, to build these natively into a new system mm-hmm. versus um, upgrade an existing system to have this. So like, you know, try and get Segwit into Bitcoin. Yeah. As an example, of this like that's that was hard. That's a tough thing, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's like two years or whatever. Um, and so for you as a as a both researcher but also an implementer and kind of connected to the to code some extent, you're like, hey, how can we bootstrap the system? Mm-hmm. And you essentially need to have as you say here, something like a bridge node is the thing that allows you to bootstrap the system because the bridge node, if, if let's say that you are just having a, um, you're the only new one on this network, mm-hmm. um, the bridge node gets to, has the history of all of the, um, I guess it, it can feed you all the proof that you need, yeah. um, which uh, is moderately expensive, but you want a feeder of those proofs to people yeah. so that people can more easily bootstrap this thing. Right, um, right. Yeah, if you, you if without a bridge node, you could do it. You could say, look, we're starting over, we're making a new coin or hard forking or whatever, mm-hmm. and now every wallet has to update their own, you know, keep proofs for their UTXOs, yeah. and we're not going to have a bridge node. Um, I don't think that's super practical because... Mm-hmm. How are you going to get people to do that? Um, but yeah, like Segwit was a soft fork, and it's hard. Um, this, what's nice is it's not a fork at all, mm-hmm. right? So you can you can start running it. It's so, so an analogy would be like a Electrum, where Electrum has this sort of client server model. There's an Electrum server. They do provide SPV proofs, which is you know something, um, but you are trusting the Electrum server to some extent. Mm-hmm. With this bridge node, it's similar in that you can have a server, the bridge node, and you connect to it and it gives you proofs. Um, and you don't need to modify Bitcoin Core. You don't need to have mining change, anything like that. Uh, so that's nice. We can just we can just have it on our own. Eventually, it might make sense to have some kind of software mm-hmm. to, to improve this. So one of the things I mentioned uh, was, and this was uh, Peter Wool's idea, um, to commit to the proofs within a block Mm -hmm. because that prevents, it doesn't prevent, but it helps mitigate the idea of here's a transaction, but I give you a wrong proof. Mm -hmm. And now you're like, well, is the the proof's wrong? I know that, but is the transaction still okay? Mm -hmm. Is there a valid proof for this? Mm -hmm. Um, So if you did soft work something in, you could say, okay, the miner needs to include like the hash of all the valid proofs Mm -hmm. so that we at least know there is one and they can can attach that set of valid proofs with the block or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, That would be a soft work. That would help with some of these kind of, a, it's more a denial of service spam attack. 
Mm -hmm. um, it would help with that, but it still works without it. So, so we're I'm not worried about that. That might take years, um, or maybe no one ever is interested enough, and so mm -hmm. it never happens, and it's okay. <laughs> and that's what I think is interesting about uh, this method: is saying, hey, we can start it up. We'll run these bridge nodes. So that it's, the bridge nodes themselves, as you say, are relatively easy to run. It's mm -hmm. like you know, 10 gigabytes of storage or 12 gigabytes, yeah, or whatever. Like and that. you need to have all the proofs in RAM, so it's you know, you know, 16 gigabytes, or whatever. You can put um, them in disk; it would just be slow. But yeah, it's yeah, I mean, so yeah. somewhere in the range of yeah, some some hard. It's drive doable space on plus, a decent computer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so you can imagine bootstrapping. It's, just, it's an interesting, and, I'm, and I, I'll be curious to see whether or not the specifics of UtreXO catch on. There's like that 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 specific mechanism and that specific accumulator, mm -hmm. and there's also a different mechanism, which is how to. Um, upgrade existing networks and hard fork and soft fork are the primary ways that people do that yeah. but this new bridge node mechanism might be an interesting way both with the accumulators but also yeah. with other things to, to I, bootstrap I wouldn't say like this so it's not a fork but there are examples of this uh, with sort of on the peer to peer level upgrades mm -hmm. uh, which have happened in bitcoin and other systems so uh, compact blocks which is a couple of years ago the idea is instead of sending the whole block over well, I already re I'll just remember all the transactions I've already sent you, and when I send you a block, I omit those transactions because I know you know what they are. I just tell you the TX ID or something. Um, that saved a lot of network traffic, and that went in uh, two years ago. I don't remember, but that wasn't a fork, right? That was just a peer-to-peer -peer upgrade kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And nodes would say, "Hey, I do this. I know about this compact block message. Do you?" And if they mm -hmm. if they both know it, they can use it. If one of them doesn't know it, then they just don't use it. Mm. Uh, so, so Utrexo can be something like that, where yeah. you you connect to nodes and say, "Hey, do you know about Utrexo?" Yeah, I know it. Okay, cool. I'll give you proofs. Yeah. Or you don't. Okay, well, I won't send you these proofs. Mm. And when you send me transactions, mm. I might have to try to find somewhere else that gives yeah, me the proofs for them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, and it's kind of like a yeah. That's so yeah. So, so it's, it's so it has more of a peer to peer, peer level. Yeah, exactly. yeah. There, there are examples of that, and that's a good way to keep upgrading because. Mm -hmm. Hard forks are really hard, and there haven't really been intentional hard forks in Bitcoin. There, there have certainly been some. There was one like two months ago. Um, <laughs> and, or no, the, wait, no, the hard fork was the bug itself. Anyway, um, the, and soft forks, there hasn't really been a soft fork in Bitcoin for a long time. And, and it, it might be that as, as these systems get more widely used, it's harder to change them. So, uh, like, you know, the internet, IPv4 versus IPv6. IPv6 is a hard fork, mm -hmm. and it just hasn't, you uh -huh. know. Uh -huh. I remember when I was a kid, they were talking about IPv6, and it's like, <laughs> oh, like late 90s. They're like, yeah, it's going to, you know, be what the new internet. And, like, I still don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a, never had an internet connection that supports it. So, <laughs> Yeah, so as you say, upgrading these old systems is hard. And so, yeah, mechanisms for doing that, especially in a peer-to-peer -peer way, seem really interesting to me. So is there... I guess in a, in a starting to get into pseudo wrap up mode. So if you think about if we think about how this would directly so from I know that you've done some like initial testing with mm -hmm. this. Um, how would this if we think about like the quantitative changes to um, the network and you're like okay this is what it looked like before and this is what it looks like after you trick so like are mm -hmm. we what um, uh, you know what. Are the actual changes and like how how you know how much um, yeah yeah so what it, initially it will not be widely used yeah, right yeah, exactly. nothing is um, so initially it's more the benefit for who the person using it so the person using it could say so and like a lot of these things I kind of write it for myself as well mm -hmm. I have a full node that I run Bitcoin on um, have my you know meager collection of, of UTXOs mm -hmm. um, and it's an old laptop that I. Found in the garbage in Japan. Anyway, because um, I figure then the you know NSA hasn't planted nice, little chips nice, in it or something. Nice. <laughs> um, but it's kind of a crummy old laptop, and the main thing is it's got a spinning hard drive, and so I will plug it in to sync up now and then because I don't really leave it on because I I feel like well if it's on then someone's gonna yeah, hack in I don't know. Um, and I plug it in and it takes a long time to sync back up, so it's catching up every week or so. And it, it's slow because of the hard drive. And so it's, it's, um, the CPU itself is only running at about 10 to 20% mm -hmm. capacity. It's the, you're waiting on the hard drive to yeah. spin around and the see. Yeah. And uh, I think with UtreXO, it would be, 
you know, 10 times faster, mm -hmm. right? Your CPU, you're still going to be limited by CPU verification, mm -hmm. but if your CPU is only running at 10% capacity, mm -hmm. now you've eliminated the I.O. bottleneck, now it can, it can run at 100% capacity, and you, you, that becomes a new limiting factor. Um, so that would be really cool. For, for people who are running on full nodes on hard drives, uh, this could be a significant speed up. Mm -hmm. For people who are running on really nice new computers with fast SSDs and lots of RAM, it actually won't really help. Mm -hmm. um, if you know, storage-wise, it could help. But already, there's already the ability to do pruning, which most people don't. Uh, I think there's not as much knowledge that this is a thing. You go into your Bitcoin.com, say pruning equals five thousand, five hundred, or whatever, and like, oh, there goes all the data that it was taking up, mm -hmm. uh, and no loss of security. So it's cool. But um, but this this primarily right now helps people with hard drives yep. um, at the cost of a little bit of extra download. Mm -hmm. So so the proofs do take up space, and when you're doing, you know, catching up, it's going to be an extra, I don't know exactly the numbers, depends on a lot of things, but maybe 20% more data over the wire mm -hmm. to uh, provide all these extra proofs. Mm -hmm. So that's a downside. So if you have a really slow internet connection and a really fast computer, you should not use this. <laughs> if you, on the other hand, have a pretty good internet connection and a kind of slow computer, this will help a lot. Got it. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Um, maybe my final question here, and then we'll be done, though, is there was, an, uh, so just as some background here, Taj gave uh, like an internal presentation to the DCI yesterday about this stuff, um, and there was a very funny moment where we were talking about um, uh, thinking about how much it costs to, um, to to essentially catch up at the beginning and, and the ways that you can catch up and do you need to check through all the proofs like that might take a lot of time and instead you could do be really cheap and just like get it straight from oh, the bridge yeah, note or whatever yeah. or you can um, but, but the idea is like oh maybe there's a way to each of these proofs is like 32 bytes or, or, or no sorry each of the, the 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 thing that I'm getting at is there was a oh no actually I think you're talking about the the actual hashing algorithm whether you're using SHA two fifty six and the hash. yeah exactly truncating the hash now this yeah. I think is just a funny concept so that's why I want to end with it it's this idea so you can see right you the idea here is that you might not need collision resistance which yeah. for those in yeah. in in hashing worlds like you almost certainly don't want if you give it two different things you want the two the hashes of six and the hash of like twenty or whatever to be totally different um but in this specific instance and this is a very implementation dpo but i think it's funny tell me about why you might not need oh, resistance. Well, it's, it's not that weird so a lot of um so there's like in cryptography we have the random oracle model and there's all these assumptions because a lot of the things in cryptography we actually don't know if they work <laughs> right there's no like so in math you can have like proofs <laughs> whereas in most science you're like i don't know it seems like the sun rises and gravity exists <laughs> yeah. like that's cool but we don't have like a proof right <laughs> whereas in math we we can have these axioms and we're like yeah no we're we're sure <laughs> um I mean, to what extent? Yeah. So, so in cryptography, on the other, we, we're not sure about anything. Mm -hmm. Like, do hash functions exist mm -hmm. at all? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it seems like it. You know, like so. RSA is so we have these assumptions. We're built. We're building off of the RSA assumption that you can't break this. Yeah. Um, we're so in hash functions. You have the random oracle model where it seems like if you you have this hash function, it looks like the stuff that comes out is random. You can't make collisions. You can't find free images. Okay, great. Um, but there's different degrees of it. So, so um, pre-image resistance, where here's the given the hash output, you can't figure out what the pre-image was, mm -hmm. is a much weaker assumption than collision resistance. Mm -hmm. Collision resistance is you can't find two different inputs that'll give you the same hash output. Mm -hmm. um, and in all the hash functions that have been broken, like MD5 and uh, last year's SHA-1, mm -hmm. they've found collisions, mm -hmm. but they're I don't know any pre-image attacks. Yeah. Where where like even MD5 is like, hey, here's this MD5, find a pre-image. Like, you can't. <laughs> um, so so pre-image is generally a lot a lot. It's a weaker assumption, but if you're relying on it, your system is then stronger. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of signature schemes where, oh, this is just relying on second pre-image or something. Mm -hmm. So part of what um, I might argue in the Utrexo paper is, hey, if you construct it in a certain way, you're not relying on the collision resistance of the hash function. You're only relying on second pre-image resistance, which is a much weaker assumption. And then you can either just say, cool, I now have a stronger security guarantee. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, well, I was OK with the existing security guarantee. So now I can sort of push it and reduce my hash size mm -hmm. so that I'm back down to the same security I was before. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but I have a smaller amount of data. Yep. Um, yep, 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 yep. So you could, you could, and that's a trade off. That yeah, there's trade offs there. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and then there's all yeah, there's things like we were saying where you could cheat and you could say, well, now that the entire state of the system is in this tiny little accumulator, I can just download it. Mm-hmm. I don't even have to sync up. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you're not verifying if you do that, but that is so. So a lot of people have talked in the context of this. A lot of people have said, yeah, UTXO commitments. Mm-hmm. You should put a commitment to the entire UTXO set in every block, mm-hmm. and then you don't have to download the blockchain. That's still SPV security, though. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping it's more like, no, we can we can have the resource similar resource costs to SPV today, but with full node security, rather than oh now SPV security is even cheaper. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's true, so you, you get both. Um, but I'm more focused on like, no, you should run a full node. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't. But this does make running an SPV security node much easier if yeah, you do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Well, um, we're out of time for today, but so thank you for coming on, Tash, and thanks sure, for yeah. chatting about both your why and the impact on society, and um, and then more generally the uh, what what the, the scaling issues might look like, and and how the difference between the the dependent variable of the mm. transactions per second uh, scalability versus the uh, validation things, and um, and with UtreXO as a subclass of of the accumulators, which are these inclusion proofs, is a way to be cheaper um, instead of needing to take all the space. And then there's all, and then just as a note for people, there is, um, this stuff actually gets implemented in code. When you actually start implementing stuff in code, it's like there's so many um, small little corner cases and small little interesting implementation details. So definitely be on the lookout, I guess, for um, for Taj's paper as it if yeah. and when it comes I'll out. I'll put um, the code up pretty soon. Yeah, yeah and I'll put the code up. Um, so I guess usually Taj at the end of the, an episode, I say, oh, where should people find you on Twitter? Though you're not really uh, you're not really actively engaged with uh, the crypto Twitterati. <laughs> I sometimes do the tweets, but yeah, I, I don't really like arguing with people on the yeah. internet which it generally devolves into. So if, so if you had a request for the listeners, would it be like, hey, yeah. check out, um, uh, you know, check out, uh, you yeah, know, this Twitter's GitHub? Okay. okay. So what's your, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, just T-Dryja. So that's T-D-R-Y-J-A. Y-J-A. Great. Yeah. And on GitHub, it's uh, Adiabat. And I, I will put the code up. So the MIT DCI repo mm-hmm. um, it, it, in GitHub is where I'll put the code. Mm-hmm. By the end of the year, I'm, I'm just going to clean the code up. Uh, it's It's super embarrassing. And, you know, clean it up a little bit. and Because uh, a lot of the commits are like, oops, yeah, exactly. that was backwards. Uh, <laughs> and it was just me working on it, basically. So I would just, you know, every five seconds commits. Yeah. So I'm going to clean that up a little bit so it's not as embarrassing and put it up publicly. Cool. That sounds great. Um, well, thank you, Taj, again. And right. thank you, listeners, for hanging out and uh, listening to this deep dive on U-Tree XO, Um And we'll see you next time. Goodbye.